Diane Henderson, Vice President of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee and Chair of the Women in Sport Commission. Let me first acknowledge the Honorable, the presence of the Honorable Shamfa Kajo, Minister of Sport and Community Development. Mr. Brian Lewis, President of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee and the Trinidad and Tobago Commonwealth Games Association. Welcome to all participants. Today we are here for the fourth annual Women in Leadership Forum, embracing change and transformation during a pandemic. We are going to hear of each, from each of them shortly, but welcome to all our attending executive members and other panelists. And we were going to, I'm now going to transfer you on to the moderators. This is Giselle Laurent West and Ms. Nadine Khan to carry us through the session. I will see you a little later at the end of the session. So welcome, enjoy, ask questions, have fun. See you shortly. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Giselle Laurent West. This is Nadine Khan. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to have you with us today. Honorable Minister, to be with you. us, um, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Our very first viral session at that moment in leadership. So we were in transformation during a pandemic. Uh, the chair, you've heard from the chair, uh, the chair of Women in Leadership. And what we would like you to do is to make sure that you are participating with us. Make sure sure that you put your, your questions in the Q&A and uh, definitely be part of this. What we've been looking at is um, the challenges that people are facing during this time. We're looking at the coping mechanisms embraced, dealing with the change and the transformation taking place, um, considering fears, maybe fears that are felt, you know, risks that are being taken, and leadership and productivity and innovation as a whole. So we're going to have a really exciting time this morning. So like Giselle said, this is our first time doing this virally. So we're very excited about it. We hope everything works in our favor this morning. And um, we encourage you to participate. But we do want to notice that we ask that you put all of your questions into the Q&A section. Giselle and I will be monitoring the Q&A section offline. And we know that and we know that a lot of you are going to be very engaged. So please, that, that's the segment that's going to be monitored. So make sure you put your questions there. We know some of you um, submitted questions beforehand, and we're going to try our very best to answer as many of those questions throughout our panel discussions. So we hope you have a wonderful morning with us, and we look forward. Right. No. As with everything, we must start with our president. So we would like to now welcome the president of the TTOC, as well as the president of the um, CANOC. Welcome, Mr. Lewis. And we will good morning, all, and good evening and afternoon, because I know that we have a number of participants from other continents and other parts of the world within the Olympic yeah. movement. As you would have heard from Giselle and Nadine, this is our first ever virtual, entirely virtual, advancing women in leadership forum. It's the fourth one. And when we conceptualized this forum four years ago, no one anticipated or even predicted COVID-19, a pandemic, a pandemic that has devastated economies and public health structures. So in a very significant way, this particular Advancing Women in Leadership Forum is the most significant today because we are into a new normal. It's not going to be the same 
there are some things that have changed and have changed forever. We have a very distinguished group of speakers that represent some significant thought leaders and I dare say visionaries across the spectrum and age range. We have, as always, the Honorable Minister of it's now Sport and Community Development, Shamfa Kujo, who has been a significant supporter of featured females and the ministry. They themselves have pink rain. But I want to make a couple of quick points that I would like to throw out for the consideration of everyone, the 300 plus participants, our distinguished speakers who will all be introduced. So it's not that I have forgotten my protocol, it is just that I don't want to tip and, and, and steal the thunder of the moderator because it's going to be an awesome forum today with some awesome speakers. But there are a couple of quick points in, in, in closing. When we talk about gender equality and the future is female and advancing women, in the context of COVID-19, we must recognize this. COVID-19 has a significant potential to be gender regressive, meaning because of the systemic and structural inequalities that were already there, the gains and transformation and advances that have been made face a very real possibility of being turned over and rolled back. Sport and sports cannot and will not and don't operate in a vacuum. Sport reflects society. An important point that runs the risk, the very real risk of COVID-19 stealing a generation of athletes, a generation of coaches, and a generation of sports administrators, if we aren't careful, and if we don't pay attention to it across, not just the Caribbean, not just Trinidad and Tobago, but the entire Pan Am and America's area, and across the globe in the Olympic movement. And what is that? You do any research, you will know that the burden of unpaid care falls proportionately, significantly on women. All the deaths that they have had globally because of COVID-19, all the people who have been infected the jury is still out as it relates to what is the long-term impact of COVID. And it is in that regard that the burden of what is called unpaid care, unpaid care will fall significantly more on women. And what is the impact of that? Sport and participation in sport will no longer be a priority. So, I welcome you. I thank you for taking time to be involved in this very important conversation and discussion. And um, I now hand over because we want to stay on the program. So I will not have been known for going on a bit too long. So I hope I have made the point and I've gotten a little kick on my shin. So I'm taking the cue. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to an awesome day of conversation and discussions and sharing of ideas 
about how we embracing change and transforming transformation during a pandemic. So it is our great, thank you, Mr. Lewis. You're welcome. And I think he's lucky we didn't have the Academy Awards music because we might press play <laughs> and start to join him out a little bit. But um, it is our great pleasure this morning to have with us um, the Honorable Shanfa Kujo, the Minister of Sports and Community Development, who has really, in her own right, been a pioneer for Future as Female. She's been a supporter of the program for the last couple of years, um, and we are very glad to have her this morning to bring some greetings and to bring some words. The Honorable Shanfa Kujo. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Mr. Brian Lewis, uh, President of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. Ms. Jamina Saldana, Vice President of the Mexican Olympic Committee. Dr. Sophia Mohammed, CEO of CISU Global Wellness. Ms. Stacey Ann King, West Indies Female Cricketer. Ms. Melissa Pascal, CEO of Pascal's Bakery Limited. Ms. Priyanka Dani, National Archer Athlete. Senator Laura Lazama Lee Singh, Consultant. Moderators, Ms. Giselle Laurent West of the TTOC. And Ms. Nadine Khan Simongal, also of TTOC, online viewers, members of the media, a hearty good morning. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be invited to bring you greetings at this Women in Leadership Symposium hosted by the Trinidad and Tobago Olympics Committee. I want to especially thank Mr. Brian Lewis for championing the cause for inclusivity and fair play in sport and for continuing to be a voice of reason, a strong tower and a guiding light in the advancement of sport in the Americas. Today, I'm both humbled and delighted by this opportunity to share the platform with some of the most beautiful and brilliant women in the country, all leaders in their own right, and just what we need to set good examples and inspire positive change for all young women and all people by extension. Earlier this week, I joined my sorority sisters of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated in bidding farewell and honoring the legacy of the late of the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, former Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Justice Ginsburg was famous for using her voice to champion gender equality, civil liberties, and paying equity. She was a feminist, an extraordinary woman, and a warrior indeed. I'm reminded of her very profound words. Women belong in all places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception. What resonates the most for me in this statement are the words, women belong. These words carry with them certainty. These words speak to confidence. These words legitimize the significance of our role and certainly speaks to our right, our right to be present, our right to influence decisions, our right to be active agents of change Anywhere decisions are being made, in our homes, in our communities, in the judiciary, in politics, and last but not least, in sports. But just like in anything, with rights come responsibilities. The responsibility to fully maximize each opportunity. The responsibility to not simply be present, but to be productive, to be relevant, and to make your mark responsibility to make room for other women and to leave the door open so that other women can join. The responsibility to chart a new way, to blaze a new trail. My mother always says, sometimes you have to rock the boat a little and if necessary, rock it a lot, but be careful not to cant it over or else you could easily throw out the baby with the bath water. That's all people talk, but you know exactly what I mean. We have to challenge the status quo. We have to change the culture. We have to make women in leadership normal. We have to make women in leadership a distinctive feature of the new normal. It is in this light that I am so excited about participating in today's forum, which provides a platform for us, leaders and influencers in the industry, to make our mark, to make our contribution to the advancement of sport 
truly re-engineering the industry in a time of uncertainty, which also happens to be a time of countless opportunities. Again, I say I am excited. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought nations to their knees. All activities have been brought almost to a screeching halt. Sports is no different. Social distancing and established health protocols have disrupted sporting calendars in every discipline all over the world. But this disruption in our, in our ability to go out and play has created an opportunity for us to examine and improve the rules of play. Rather than fixate on what we can't do, let us focus on what we could and should do. We can now place keen attention on all areas of sport that we had been too busy or too distracted to pursue. It is in this light that I commend the TTOC president, Mr. Brian Lewis, and the Sport Integrity Global Alliance for the work that they are doing on promoting diversity and inclusion in sport, tackling issues of race, opportunities for the differently able and for women to get to the board level. With, border, with, with borders now closed and international sport activities at an all-time low, or should I say an all-time low, we can place more focus on home, maximizing the full potential of sport to fight crime, to unite people, and to rebuild our communities. We must utilize sport as a tool to improve the standard of living for athletes, delivering training programs to help athletes with basic life skills, time management, money management, career planning, marketing, communications, and how to deal with the media. We must use this opportunity to assist and advance the business side of sport, assist in administration, strategic planning, succession planning, accounting, proposal writing, comprehensive capacity building for both national sporting organizations and community groups. We must take this opportunity to promote and expand total participation in sport, bring in the disabled, the women, the seniors, and those in the rural communities. We must take this opportunity to improve infrastructure, providing access to proper facilities for the rural communities and developing our existing facilities to meet international standards so that we can host the regional and international games. We must spend time on research and development as it relates to sport, seeing sport as a science. It is not about recreation only and it doesn't happen success doesn't happen by guess sport is the type of science where exactly what you put in is what you get out of it we must use this opportunity to expand to use sport as a means of expanding and transforming our economy we trinidad and tobago would have hosted the cpl this year successfully against the backdrop of the covid pandemic this helped to generate much needed economic economic activity when the vendors needed it most and we are well set to host the Commonwealth Youth Games in 2023, and we will do so successfully also. All these considerations must form an integral part of planning the way forward as we take advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity to create the new normal. We at the Ministry of Sport and Community Development, we remain committed to rolling up our sleeves and getting the job done. We are indeed happy to have the TTOC on board and to have access to their wide network of technical resources and stakeholders. One goal, one mission. We are stronger together and we'll come out of this pandemic better and brighter than ever. I want to thank the TTOC for inviting me to participate in this wonderful exercise. I wish you a productive and enjoyable symposium. May God bless the TTOC. May God bless the entire sporting fraternity. I may God richly bless our nation. I thank you. We thank the minister for her absolute powerful and inspiring words this early morning. I think for me personally, the strongest takeaway from what she said to us is women belong. And I think in each and every one of us, we need to feel like we belong. We belong in everything. We belong in sport. We belong in leadership. We belong in business. And I think just if you had to take away just one statement from the minister's remarks, it's that women belong. 
Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Giselle, and Giselle is going to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. So our keynote speaker today is Dr. Sophia Mohammed. She's the CEO of SISU Global Wellness. Dr. Mohammed brings her dynamism to this panel as she pioneers a wellness revolution in Trinidad and Tobago, and she's well known for doing that. She holds several portfolios, Chair of Gender Advocacy Advisory Board, Institute of Gender and Development Studies of UE. She's a facilitator of United Nations Women Foundations Program, Strengthening Prevention, Approaches to Address Gender Balance, Violence, um, and Gender-Based Violence in the, in the Caribbean. She's the Architect for Change of Habitat for Humanity. She's a Council Member of the Medical Association of Trinidad and Tobago. And she shares with us that her ability to achieve extraordinary results and balance the multiple roles that she has to take care of is by doing her daily practice of yoga and mindfulness. And of course, with the adventurous seven-year-old she has, that is very hard to do sometimes. She highlights one of her de defining moments in her career as being assigned physician to the Nobel Peace Prize winner of 2014, Malela Yousafzai, on her visit to Trinidad and Tobago, reminding all of us the power of one's voice. And so she is very, very um, important to us in this discussion because she talks about women, she talks about defining voice, she knows how important it is for us moving forward as women. So let's welcome Dr. Sophia. Good morning, everyone. A special welcome to our Honorable Shamfa Kujo, Minister of Sport and Community Development and President of Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee, Brian Lewis, and our phenomenal moderators here, Nadine Khan and Giselle Aron. Thank you so much for that introduction. And of course, a very dynamic uh, panelist for this entire webinar. This is the fourth Women in Advance in Leadership TTOC conference, and it's the first virtual. And it is my distinct, distinguished honor to be part of it and to be here with you to share these words. Of course, a special, very special welcome to our media and to all of the attendees. Today is a phenomenal day. Today is a defining day. Today is a day where we are going to catalyze change because I'm certain every single one of our speakers is going to tap into their experiences, how they have embraced change in their life, how they have embraced transformation, and more so, how they are being resilient. And that's what I've focused on for this particular conversation I'm just switching screens here now. So one second with the tech. Today's particular conversation is going to be on resilience through a crisis. How can we, all of the women and men who have joined in here, tap into our innate resilience? Now, I want to ask you, if you had a superpower, what would you want that to be? Our Honorable Shamfa Kujo started off this speech with a very powerful message from a mentor of my own and of course most women across the world that women belong in all places and of course it was echoed by Nadine Khan those words women belong and that indeed is one of Ruth Bader Ginsburg superpowers her fearlessness I want to ask you does this particular image looks familiar? I specifically put in some males in here because while I know this is women in advance, women advancing in leadership, our advancing also is directly related to the men and the families, the environment, the ecosystem that surrounds us. I'm sure anyone who's looking at this screen thinks this is indeed a familiar background. It's one for myself as well, as I try to manage the many roles that you all heard there. The most important one I would say is the mummy role and how I'm managing that, plus being a medical doctor and of course the other administrative roles. So here's what, here's what we know that are certainties, that the overall severity of this pandemic and the pattern of the disease progression, we are certain that this is going to last for a long time. We are certain that in the level of collaboration between the countries, we will find solutions. 
We are certain that the healthcare system is responding to our crises. We are certain, unfortunately, of the devastating economic impact, the consequences of this crisis. However, the positive is we have seen that the level of social cohesion we've seen in response to this crisis has brought us significant transformational change. And from a medical perspective, and we brought it up initially in our pre-conversation, here's another thing we're very certain of. We're certain that every single one of us now is feeling stressed. Our mental health, our emotional dysregulation is tapped into and maxed out. We have no other choice but to be able to expand our bandwidth. And that's why I wanted to bring to you a little bit of Medicine 101. What is stress? The emotional and physical response you experience when you perceive an imbalance between the demands placed on you and your resources and coping skills to deliver optimally. So it's that demand, that imbalance between the demand on you and your coping skills. And that's why this particular webinar and conferences like this is so crucial to empowering, to advancing our women, to advancing the communities that our women support. I'm not gonna go into this one in detail, but yes, stress affects every single part of our body. Often, however, it's reported that 88% of all medical practitioners ask the question, are you feeling stressed, almost down to the end of the questionnaire. I think it needs to be reversed because probably it is the number one reason for most of our detriments right now. So I return to that question. If you had a superpower, what would you want it to be? And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we continue here. When, the con when this conversation was introduced, you all were told I'm CEO of a company called SISU, S-I-S-U, Global Wellness. I wanna bring you to your attention what the word SISU means. It is that extraordinary determination, that courage and resoluteness in the face of extreme adversity. It is that action mindset, it is a resilience mindset, which enables individuals to see beyond their present limitations. It is actually an integral element of the Finnish culture and a universal capacity which we all possess within us. Now, more than ever, we need to tap into our inner Sisu. So I want to bring your attention to the superpower of Sisu that we all possess within. This company was formed three years ago, and it almost as if uh, I anticipated that we would need resilience training. Three years ago, when I was doing training at the United Nations of Institute in Training and Research, I chose one of my leadership courses to be critical thinking and resilience. However, I realized that I learned a lot about resilience from this little superpower here, my son. And in our introduction, someone mentioned hope. He who plants a tree plants hope. I want us to continue to plant seeds of hope and know that even the smallest action can change the world, even the smallest thought. This little superpower here is now eight years old. He's going to turn nine just now. And he, unfortunately, by medical terms, he has been diagnosed with a, with a disorder. However, I choose to focus on his extraordinary abilities. And he is one who has shown me his resilience. I love living in his world. And I know many of our listeners here, many of those who are attending, all may be struggling with different abilities or extraordinary abilities with our children, with ourselves that we have to overcome. In those moments of trying to figure out how are we overcoming it, let's look back at what we have already succeeded and overcome. And of course, hold on to that hope. The other person that has shared a lot or taught me a lot of resilience is this particular woman here, Malala Yousafzai, the youngest Nobel Peace Prize winner. Some of you may be familiar, she visited here in Trinidad a few years ago, and she's 
a young woman who fought for education of women in Pakistan. She fought so relentlessly for it that she was shot in the head by the Taliban and then in an ICU. When she visited here in Trinidad, it was my distinct honor to spend an entire week with her and to be able to share and hear her stories of resilience and why she continues to fight and advocate for women's rights, empowering us all to listen, to tune into our voice. These are just a few other pictures of what brings me my resilience. Some may tap into their yoga. Some may tap into the strengths of their past and the stories that they've overcome. I do miss all the excursions, all the things that I would have done outwardly, the outreaches that we did with say Habitat or the Medical Association, but we will soon return to our new reality and find ways to adapt through it. Through medical school, through a lot of different academic uh, facilities, we've all been taught about IQ and EQ. But I want to bring your attention quickly to a new intelligence, that one that I want us to empower each one of ourselves and our communities with, the power of AQ. What's that, you may have said? You may not have known or heard about AQ. It is that adaptability, the process of adapting, of persevering, especially through this crisis. And as I shared with Sisu, we all have it within us to emerge from this adversity, from these tragedies, from this trauma, without losing hope. Or, as my son likes to say, he just likes to be Tigger. How do we bounce back? So how do we build resilience? I just want to draw your attention to the three questions. I want to ask you, are you a person that sees a stressor as a change, as negative, as an, or as an insurmountable problem, or as a challenging situation that requires a new way of thinking or being? Do you focus on the problem or do you focus on the solution? Do you let fear make your choices? So when you ponder on those questions, you'll realize where you fall in your adaptability coefficient and where you may need to fill your gaps. This is a quick little matrix that can help you decide where you are with your adaptability coefficient and where you may need to work on. This COVID-19 makes us feel like if we're trapped in a matrix, being at home, some of us are so restricted where we're unable to move about because if we have unwell parents or unwell spouses, these four points of developing your own personal resilience, your coping strategies, your grit, your emotional intelligence, your ability to determine logically from the past, making life as meaningful and holding on to that sense of purpose. Giselle mentioned the word there, mindfulness and yoga. It is one of the most powerful things you can add to your armory of coping skills. I want you all who are listening and tuned in here, anytime you feel stressed to mention these words, I will breathe. I will think of solutions. I will not let my worry control me. I will not let my stress level break me. I will simply breathe and it will be okay because I do not quit. And more than ever in a time of COVID-19 where it affects our respiratory abilities, we are seeing that importance. Yes, we know the importance of our breath, but it comes to the fruition, it comes to the forward thinking of us, how important our breath is, something we often take for granted. So I bring you back as I close, what is that superpower? Tap into that superpower. If you had a superpower, what would you want it to be? I leave you with these two. Would you want it to be fear or would you want it to be resilience? We have to begin to do what is unusual. Even in the midst of this crisis, when everyone is feeling lack and poverty, we have to do the unusual, to love when everyone is angry and judging others, to demonstrate courage and peace when everyone is in fear to show kindness when others are displaying hostility and aggression, and to surrender to the possibility when the rest of the world is aggressively pushing to be the first, trying to control outcomes and fiercely competing in an endless drive to get to the top, to knowingly smile in the face of adversity and to cultivate the feeling of wholeness, even if we are diagnosed as sick. 
I leave you with this thought. And of course, I know that every one of us may be also having a health challenge. So for every single one of those who are attending here, this is a special that my clinic decide to offer to every one of the attendee on your very next consultation. I am there, the Care Clinic and Medical Center. Jump onto their Facebook page. You will see the flyer for the TTOC webinar. Just jump on and said you attended here, put a message about this, about this presentation and that entitles you to your next cons consultation. For those who wish to get in contact with me, it's Sisu Global Wellness at gmail.com. I am ever so grateful for this opportunity to share with all of the attendees here in this conference, encouraging every single one of you all to create your resilience, to be the person who shapes your destiny and to transform your life purposefully and, int and intentionally. I thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Mahal. Inspirational words, I think they were phenomenal. What is your superpower? Well, Dr. Mahal said, if you had a superpower, what would you want it to do? Because I, I think personally, I have several superpowers already. But if I had to pick one, I would think that I would want the superpower of being able to be in different places at the same time. Being a mother of three boys, and working full time and serving on the TTOC and serving in basketball and serving all over. I think I would want it to be able to be in several places at the same time so I could be working and be at home cooking so I didn't have to work and then come home and cook. I wish they could be done. And I mean, it's difficult at this time as well during the pandemic. But I think a few things that um, we need to take away from Dr. Mohammed definitely we need to know and understand about Sisu and learn a little bit more. So perhaps if you can read up about that, because we're talking about grit, we're talking about bravery, we're talking about resilience and the ability to harness all of them and give that into your own personal um, being, uh, being able to project to that in your everyday life. Certainly the, the resilience and of course the adaptability during this time of the pandemic, the ability to adapt the AQ, as she says. So let's let's look at that a little. We need to to really look up on Sisu uh, a little bit more. But Dr. Mohammed, before you leave us, I have a few questions. And it, feel free, anybody, if you have a question, put it in the Q and A for us, so that we can actually ask the panelists, ask the speak, the, um, the keynote speaker, right? I now was just well. about to say, Giselle, that Giselle and I are looking at the screen, and I would think that after such an invigorating presentation that we would have seen the, the Q&A section lighting up. I guess it was that it was so, so relatable that, that no, everybody understood and nobody has any questions because we're not seeing any questions in the Q&A section, but feel free to put your questions in there and we'll have them, we'll try to have them answered as much as possible within our time constraints. But I, what I would like to ask you, Dr. Mohamed, one quick question. What are some challenges that you have faced with Sisu and, um, you know, the currency in particular during this pandemic, if you, if you don't mind answering that. Certainly. So <laughs> some of the challenges, um, it can, I can buy that personally or from the company itself, right? Sisu Global Wellness is a training company and we've now had to move, adapt very quickly into the virtual world. Um, my son, like I shared, is autistic and I've had to hel help him adapt into the virtual world. And anyone who's familiar with autistics know they do not like the thing called change. They like structure. They like things as it is. And every single day is a completely different day. So now more more than ever, the role of women is stretched. We now really have to tap into our superpowers because we're balancing all of those roles, plus, of course, maintaining our sanity behind it. I think we are put, we have been deprioritizing our wellness. And if I can leave anyone with a message here today, is to prioritize your well-being and your wellness to just maintain during this this pandemic. Thank you very much. And I hope everybody takes heed.
But I know that during this pandemic, I've been taking much more vitamins than I've ever taken in my life. I'm taking letters that letters of vitamins that I didn't never even knew existed, C's and B's and B's and zinc and turmeric and, and, and things that I, I never even knew existed. So I think personally, I am my wellness has gone from where what it's increased tremendously, just just your knowledge base of things that have been around you for a very long time that you never paid attention to, for example, to marriage. Something that, you know, we all know about growing up in an East Indian family, we have been growing in our yard and we never knew the extreme benefits of something like to marriage. So I think just your knowledge base on things that attribute to your wellness has grown so tremendously in this pandemic. Um, um, Giselle, I'll turn back over to you to see if there are any more of the questions yeah. there. And I see coming we have some questions on our QA. Right. So I will actually read one of the questions from the QA. It says, Dr. Mohammed, thank you for a lot of this amazing presentation. Do you think if the restrictions during the, pandem the pandemic were not that strict, would the level of stress and depressions be less? So that's a very interesting question. Thank you so much for asking it, uh, um, Elvira. Here's the thing. Unfortunately, these restrictions are necessary at this time because COVID, SARS-CoV-2, this particular virus is unfortunately so contagious. So we need to balance. We have to find that happy medium with uh, maintaining those restrictions. They're very new. And anytime there's behavior change and something going out of our typical comfort zone, there would be this increased stress. And this is why things like this, webinars like this, we have to find coping strategies. One of my girlfriends, uh, we decided for her birthday because we couldn't do this, we did a Zoom party as her birthday. We were most upset that that's what we had to do and most depressed because we like to dress up and go out, but we've had to adapt. Another things you can do is as Nadine shared, she learned all of a sudden about different health benefits of different medications, different herbs, different natural things. There's that beauty in gardening. There's that beauty in eating healthy. There's that beauty in finding ways to exercise with your family, even if you're at home. So if the restrictions are less, I can't necessarily say the depression or the stress would be less because then we are at more at risk of spreading COVID-19. I think it's more for us to focus on finding solutions to cope with this new reality. Um, a lot of persons use the word new norm and I love the new norm, but here's the thing, nothing is normal about this normal. So it's a new reality. So we have to find coping strategies to deal with the stress, embrace it, accept it, acknowledge it in every single one, including myself, believe me. Uh, I, that's why I enjoy my moments with my girlfriends, with my colleagues. I have a mindful moment, a gratitude moment every single morning. So let's find ways to cope and reduce our stress. Wonderful. Wonderful, definitely. I mean, it's, it's very important for us to remember to decrease our stress. And I was speaking to somebody recently and they were saying that, you know, I was just stuck in a doldrum and doing one specific thing all my life. And in the pandemic, yes, with this change, I have been able to discover that I have new skills. And I think that's one of the things that we have to also bear in mind that even though we're in this pandemic and there is change, we need to transform ourselves. We need to transform the way we look at things, the opportunities that we may have that we never thought that we, you know, we were exposed to. So those are some of the things that we have to start thinking about as well in this new normal. So Dr. Mohammed, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate your time with us, your words of wisdom. I'm sure many people will be coming to Sisu and definitely looking for advice and um, for medical advice as well as uh, encouragement and everything that a woman Basic can health and need. wellness. Health and, and wellness. wellness. I'm, and leaving, I'm leaving the email and the contact number in the chat. So for anyone, and then yes, I'm seeing some persons asking they want the presentation. We'll let TTOC um, share it through to all the attendees. It's I was just, just about to answer it in a general way. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being Thank here. you so much, everyone. And know that we are really all in this together. So... Again, thank you. So this morning now, we're going to move on to our first panel.
And the topic out of the first panel is leveraging your power, being fearless and innovative in this time. So I think Dr. Mohammed's intro speech and keynote speech was so excellently pleased that it's led us beautifully into this segment because when I when she Dr. Mohammed spoke about Sisu, I instantly went to my phone and Googled it. And I see that it's a it's a finished concept that talks about stoic determination, spirit, bravery, resilience. And then she spoke about her superpowers. So I think that the keynote speech has led us perfectly into this panel one topic, this discussion. And we have on our panel for the first discussion, we have um, Miss Melissa Pascal, who is the CEO of Pascal's Bakery Limited, a second generation family enterprise one of the largest private labeling baking companies in Trinidad and Tobago. We also have on our panel um, Stacey Ann King, cricketer, West Indies female cricketer, 2016 ICC World T20 champion, Trinidad and Tobago Cricketer of the Year awardee, um, sports broadcasting on ESPN Caribbean, um, and she has an art, of science, art and science of coaching from the University of the West Indies. And we also have on our panel Priyanka Dani. Priyanka is a former national athlete of Team TTO who is the highest ranked female compound archer in the Southern Caribbean during her five years of competing. Um, so I think Priyanka will do very well in the Hunger Games. She um, graduated from the University of West Indies, Cape Hill, with a bachelor's in sports science with concentration in exercise science and coaching competing with first class honors. She's also a level two archery coach in the, under the USA Archery. Priyanka has recently started her own business as a health and wellness coach. She's recently launched her brand, PD Aesthetics, which focuses on various aspects of health and sport. Her focus is on psychological skills development in sports, and she also has a passion for helping individuals with mental health conditions. Through her studies and passion for psychology, she wants to help athletes manage emotions, challenge negative thinking patterns, improve relationship skills, and reduce stress and anxiety, which is, was also discussed by Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, ladies, and welcome to the panel, and thank you for joining us this morning. If we start off with Melissa Pascal, who will give us a few words here. Pascal? Yes, good morning. Wow, we have had some riveting conversation so far, but just been making notes. Dr. Mohammed, the Honorable um, Minister, you know, what Dr. Mohammed said about what you focus on grows, that is a fact. Um, I recently had a daughter, she's five months old. She was born in the, in the midst of the pandemic, April 3rd. And um, the business as well, because I, I am the CEO of Pascal's Bakery, um, was faced with, with some serious problems. We could never plan because he made the Prime Minister would come on and basically the plan made yesterday was changed at the midday conference. And uh, I was there sitting at home with a five-day-old baby and having to make some serious decisions. And you know what? What you focus on grows. At the end of the day, when you focus on growth, when you accept, embrace exactly where you are, regardless of what you're facing, regardless with a babe in your arm, anything is possible. And it's possible as well because of support. I do have very strong support from my, from my family, from my husband, from my mother, from my brothers. So don't, don't see it's only, it's only a mindset, what you focus on, but you must have the support to get through something that is as challenging as this pandemic. So I think now we can turn over to Stacey Ann King, just to give us a few words on her background. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning, we can hear you very well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so for me, I grew up in sports. So my mom and my sisters all played cricket um, while I was growing up. 
Um, unfortunately, I didn't play cricket alone. I played football as well. So I represented Trinidad in, in national women's football as well. Um, it was quite challenging coming from a rural area of Sandy Grandi, um, where you, you, had to, you had to do something different. But again, skill, batting, bowling, and feeling, it drew crowds and it drew supporters. So that in itself, you know, it, it, it started to not be a, a male-dominated sport anymore. Supporters would come out to have a look at, at the women play, to look at girls play. And I think all of that would have helped, you know, develop a pathway um, in the Sandy Grandy for young girls um, to make their stand in sport. I like the comments from uh, the Honorable Minister that women belong, challenge the status quo. In particularly, I would draw reference to the Women's World Cup in Australia earlier this year, the Women's T20 final, where Australia and India played to an 86,174 crowd, million crowd at the MCG. I think that in itself shows that women are leveraging the power of sport in cricket. And definitely, I mean, it, it has, it needs to grow. And especially in the Caribbean, we need to get a bit more, you know, happening in pathways for young girls and women in sport. I have personally been training with a couple of my friends online. We've been doing, you know, they from Guyana, Barbados. We've been doing virtual sessions, you know, just trying to help motivate each other because it just becomes kind of, yeah, this condense about training and why am I doing this when there's nothing happening in my sport, you know? So it, it has been motivating to have them on board and we, chat each to each other and motivate each other to get through sessions on a daily basis. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Stacey. And it must be very interesting knowing that you've just, uh, you've just performed for an audience of 86,000 and then you're now stuck in a pandemic. And I don't know when you're going to be performing again. Um, we, we now turn over to Priyanka, who is going to just share with us a little bit about herself and give us a few words. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me clearly? Yes, we can. All right. So um, just a little bit about my background. I wasn't always involved in sports. Um, you know, growing up, I tried to get involved in different extracurricular activities. Nothing really felt like where I fit in until I started archery. And... You know, starting a sport like archery, something that's not, not as popular, not as common, especially in the Caribbean, um, it made me realize a lot of the importance of being prepared as an athlete. And, um, you know, my sport taught me a lot about mental health, which is what kind of guided me into the career path that I am on now. And through that, you know, I want to share a little bit about um, what my business is and what my brand is around. And I'd like to start by, by sharing a question. How can I make this situation more effective so that I'm able to survive in this new world with the resources I still have left, right? So why did I choose to launch my brand at the beginning of the pandemic? Because I started um, my work in March, which is when Trinidad and Tobago kind of now went under lockdown with all the COVID-19 restrictions. And it's because I think that this is something that we need now more than ever. Just as Dr. Mohammed said, this pandemic is seriously affecting our mental well-being. Practicing mindfulness by itself, that alone has such tremendous benefits on our mental health, our mental state. And, you know, um, aside from, from my business being around health and wellness, it also focuses on athletes. And when you look at how COVID-19 has affected sports, um, just as Stacey said, you know, when you look at athletes all around the world, it's not just the practicing and the competing that is being affected, but it's also their mental state. When I've, I've read so many articles about how athletes have been commenting on their mental well-being affected by not being able to practice, not being able to train with their teammates as they would like to, and having to be in um, isolation for two weeks before any game that they need to participate in. So, you know, I share a lot of the sentiments with Dr. Mohammed, especially in the importance of well-being, um, of wellness. And secondly, the other point I would like to touch on is part of embracing change is sharing your knowledge with others. So there's 
an unspeakable fulfillment in knowing that someone that you share your knowledge with can use it to make their own situation better. Right. And that's why I strongly believe that sharing knowledge is so important. Sharing the knowledge that I acquired in my journey from my undergrad being in sports science to now pursuing my master's in kinesiology. And, you know, I think that it's, it's very important that this, a webinar like this, sharing our knowledge with one another and our experiences so that we can help other women, not just uplift themselves, but also pass that on to others is very important. Great. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Uh, we appreciate that. You seem to have done quite a lot in your young tender years so far. Um, we would just like to ask a few questions of the panel, specific to the to the leveraging your power, being fearless and innovative. Um, so I know that none of you really touched on it fully. So there may be a few questions of the people in the audience they want to ask. So please send it in the Q and A. It seems to be a very quiet audience this morning. Did we did we have? Breakfast? Did we, did we go to Pascal's Bakery for, for breakfast this morning? Because we seem to be very quiet. We, we, we keep if you all see me keep glancing over, it's because I keep glancing over the Q&A, hoping that it's, it's going to be lighting up and, and running down. Because I'm thinking that with these empowering women, we should be glad to be have this opportunity to have so many questions to ask them. So uh, I'll, I'll just take the first one. Um, um, and this is similar to Pascal from Pascal's Bakery. And it's, um, did you have to come up with creative and innovative concepts in order to manage your business during COVID? I know we may have a lot of small business owners on and you might be able to share things that you have had to adjust in your business um, to make sure that, that it survived the pandemic. Might be helpful to the other, some of the attendees. You know, certainly, without a doubt, at the end of the day, it's all about mindset. You constantly need to have a mindset that you're just willing to, to deal with being uncomfortable. Once you could just come to terms with being uncomfortable, one, and then once you get accustomed to that feeling, then you will be able to then see some clarity, assess your playing field, assess, assess your, your external factors, because that, that is critical, especially now. When things are so volatile, the change is constant, and it's beyond rapid. It's faster than anything you've ever experienced, at least I've ever experienced. And you know what? It forces you to become extremely sharp. So it's absolutely critical that we understand that we need to be sharpening our minds, our emotions, our spiritual aspects every single day. Because without that sharpening, we become dull so quickly. And when you become dull, you innovation and creativity and that growth mindset is difficult for you to, to actually respond, create, and lead because that's critically important. And you know what? Now I find myself investing more in my mental. I listen to the Archbishop Jason Gordon at least two, three times a week as well spiritual, for my spiritual, that's the God of my understanding. Um, so I really focus on, on mental health. Um, spiritual health, emotional health, and physical. I, you know, I am I'm a big, I'm an ex, um, a former national hockey player as well. You know, I ran some, um, some triathlons. I ran when I was six months pregnant with my mother in Disney. So, you know, it's really finding that balance, especially now. You know, I pick up the telephone and I call, um, I do 30-day challenges with, with my friends, meaning we read a chapter of certain books over and over for our mindset on gratitude. Um, we speak about our goals every single day. And when you are that focused as an individual, then you can lead your company. You can't lead when you're not clear, when you don't have defined goals. You know, I have a question for the audience. Have you taken the time to define your personal goals, your business goals? And if not, start today. Pick up the pen right now and write down your goals. What are your goals? And be specific. Put strong deadlines on it and get yourself an accountability a coach, get yourself an accountability partner and stick to it. Great. Thank you very much. That, that makes a lot of sense for many of us and I'm sure many people could attest to that. Um, you need to be able to, to focus. I think focus is one of the key things. Um, let me ask you another question. As facilitator of the youth business for Trinidad and Tobago, how are you leveraging your power to encourage the youth? to continue to persevere during this specific time? 
Um, so I do this simple, simple. Um, one of my little things that I do is something called talks on the move. This is when I'm walking my daughter um, in the stroller, I'm out of breath, I'm sweaty, it's not pretty, but you know what? I do a, a, a snippet and of all the work that I'm doing personally, because I have to grow daily in order to, as I said, to, I keep on saying this, to keep myself sharp. I share, I share my readings, I share my thoughts, I, I, I have talks and move on, on all my social media, as well as, you know, I really um, believe 1000% in giving back. You only give it back, that's a part of my DNA, in terms of what I do internally in my organization. You know, focusing a lot on leadership and really communicating with, with Pascal's staff as well, um, to really ensure that my staff is in a mental state that, that they can lead their families because we hire a lot of women, a lot of underprivileged women, you know, and um, it's critically important. It's critically important to keep your, 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 your staff in the right mindset. Um, and as well as I've worked alongside Shell and, and really focusing on entrepreneurship and youth. And um, I wasn't able to work on that as much because of my pregnancy and so forth, but I am so open to, to I go back to my school for your name, Convent, my alma mater, which I love so much. You know, so any opportunity at all, I'm there, 1,000% hands down. Well, thank you for that, Melissa. And I know thank you for your open and honest answers to our questions. You know, it, it gives great insights into your life and, and the challenges that you face. And, and we thank all the panelists today for, you know, being open and sharing, not just what, what good is coming, but, but what challenges they are facing, because that's a way of empowering others to, to share what your challenges are. So we, the, these, the next question I have is actually for Stacey Ann King. And um, share a little bit with us about how you will be able to be creative in your training methods during the pandemic and what advice you may have for young cricketers who just think, you know, okay, cricket has stopped, I can't train, team sports are on a lockdown and, you know, what, what different things that they may be able to do so they can keep training? Um, well, personally for me, I've, I've been able to have my own space to train. So I have a, a small home gym that during the pandemic, it really hasn't bothered me a lot. I mean, it bothered me just to not be able to get outdoors and, and run or, you know, have most of my teammates there to train with. Um, but I've been able to, you know, motivate myself because I'm very self-motivated. And I think that's really important as an athlete, um, you know, to get up and still maintain your routine and your training program. Uh, I've done a lot of it with uh, two players who don't even live in Trinidad. And I've tried to do it a lot with my club team, Petrofrax, I have, you know, women's cricket has also been put on hold um, locally here. And, you know, you are custom being outdoors on a weekend playing cricket. And now there's absolutely nothing, especially for the young under 19 players who, you know, they are custom being outdoors. They're not accustomed just being indoors and, and not doing stuff. And it became tough. I started as the captain of my team. I started having no charades, you know, having Zoom touch with them. And WhatsApp chat where we play games, we do charades, uh, we do last man standing fitness sessions, you know, just to keep them involved and, and keep motivated because, I mean, it, as, as, as was said earlier, this, this pandemic isn't going anywhere. So we have to try to adapt as much as possible and to motivate others because we are not sure what mental state they are in. I am self motivated, but not very much many other athletes may be especially young ones coming up. So I think it's really important that, you know, I can stand up there and, and say, guys, let's, let's do this. Let's come on board. Let's come on Zoom at a certain time. And uh, we're going to have, you know, a uh, uh, punch for beers or, you know, something just to make it interesting um, to keep them uh, and also let them know that, you know, we care, you know, as, as the technical staff, we care. And, you know, we support them through this pandemic. Right, great, thank you. Um, we do have a question actually coming from Rahima, um, from our Q&A to you, uh, Ms. King. And what she's saying is, what advice would you give to improving mental health for the young cricketers around you, those who you've trained with, um, maybe advice that you would give them personally? And do you feel that you have the power to do that? 
Yes, I feel that I have the power to do so. Um, I mean, I have a wealth of experience playing for West Indies women. Um, I've also done uh, courses as well. Um, I think that as young athletes right now, they really need our motivation. They need us as, as, as adults to, you know, share our experiences. Um, sometimes, you know, it's not always going to be positive. It's not always going to be what they want to hear. Um, but during this pandemic time, reach out to somebody. Um, I, I have like three young players under me right now that I check in on every other day. I, you know, give them, I try to, you know, just tap their brains a little bit just to see how, where they are at and, and keep them motivated. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say it's tough, but during this time as an adult and as an experienced athlete, I, I think it's necessary, not just for me, but for other athletes as well. So, you know, just check in on those younger players. Great. That's really good to really good to know because it's important for us as adults to yeah. be able to look out for, for those. It's, it's important for all of us in this pandemic in, in a time when social interaction is, is non-existent. It's, it's important on a social basis for us to reach out to one another, keep in touch, you know, make sure how are you doing, you know, on a regular basis. So it's it's important as athletes to reach out to other athletes and you know see how their training is going encourage them even the younger ones because it's a very difficult phase in society if you are a young athlete who just started training who just started coming through the rounds and then to have this completely disrupt whatever you were now building if you were just speaking it's a it's a difficult time and mentally um it, it can cause a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety of what the future holds for them because we don't know how long this will go on. So it's important that senior athletes, you know, reach out to the younger athletes and be very encouraging at this time. And, and um, I think that's what the yes. question was asking, kind of. Right. So I think we have a question for Priyanka and... Um, it talks about your business venture and um, what, is, what made you decide at this point in time to launch this business venture and leverage your power as an influential athlete to do so, especially now at this time. Okay, so um, my business being around health and wellness and, uh, you know, helping not just individuals, but like I said, with a focus on sports and athletes, um, manage their wellness and their their mental health specifically um what kind of inspired this venture was my time as an athlete because everyone involved in the sports of archery would tell you that archery is a sport that's 90 percent mental and 10 percent physical right there's a lot of focus there's a lot of concentration that's needed to perform well in a sport like this and it was only when i in my years of competing that i started to realize how little focus is placed on sports psychology on mental training um and now like with the, in since then i've seen that a lot of there's a lot more work being done a lot more research coming out on it and you know it's really great to see um and this is something that i've wanted to do since i've been competing and why i chose to do it now um, aside from there being an extra availability of time <laughs> to do something like this was because I saw that, you know, people don't like to be isolated. As human beings, we are very social. Um, you know, we love to be around our friends and family. We love to interact with people. And when you look at some of the research out there on depression and anxiety, a lot of it is now there are higher percentages of depression and anxiety, not just for athletes, but individuals across the board because of the isolation that they are in, because they can't function as what we would consider normal. Um, as, as simple as, you know, um, taking a walk on the beach. Now, well, here in Trinidad, we can't go to the beach as we want to. Um, we can't socialize in a way that we are accustomed to doing. And especially in Trinidad, you know, we're very um, social creatures. We're very social people. And 
when all this started, it was, I looked at it as a great opportunity for me to launch my brand because it's a way for people to, it's a way for me to help people manage their mental health and reach out and why I, how, how I was able to leverage my power from being a national athlete was because of the networking that I established during that time. And the following that I had, I chose to use that to encourage people to reach out, encourage people to help one another. And, um, you know, as Melissa said, it's just a big part of it is mindset. A big part of it is, you know, keeping that focus and keeping that positivity and being able to share that knowledge with other people who need it. Um, Another thing about my business is it's completely online. So the restrictions of COVID doesn't really affect the reach or the interaction that I have with my clients because it's all done through, it's completely virtual. So, you know, that's another benefit that I have in, in terms of being able to adapt well and quickly. And that's something that I would recommend to other small businesses and um, athletes as well. You know, being able to adapt and, and adjust to the situation quickly and in a positive way really does work to the advantage. That's correct. That's correct, Priyanka. And and we actually have a question from somebody here saying, how do you how do you recharge and re-energize, regain that optimum uh, level of performance and keep it going during this time and you know and beyond generally? Um, that's a great question because that is something that a lot of people don't do or they don't know how to do um you know from my time as as when i was there was a point in time when i was competing that i was studying full time and i was also working for a short period of time too and doing all those things that can really overwhelm you you know it, it doesn't just we don't just need covid to feel that um and i think a very important thing to note is know when you need a break you know, listen to your body, listen to your mind, know when you just need to take some time off and do something that relaxes you, do something that you enjoy, because it really helps to recharge your mind. And, and, you know, rest is really important. I think people underestimate the importance of rest and, and relaxation. Um, being able to take that break and listen to your body and know when you need to stop for a little while, because some people think if you stop, you may not be able to, you may lose out or you may, you know, be wasting time. But if you stop, you take a rest and you, you're able to refocus, recharge, and then you can go back even stronger. You know, it can yeah, create I, more I, benefits in the I long run. I agree with that. Yeah. Yes, I agree rest. with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I forget about rest most I think, of the time. I think I need to Google that. Like I had to Google to see this. I, I don't know. Like, let me Google rest. Yeah. Because as a, mother, a working mother of three, I, I don't think I understand what that word is. I, I may have to Google that word as well, so you might have to give me some time to Google rest. But it's very important. <laughs> it's it very is important. definitely very important. And I know the importance of it. You know, it's just in this time, it, 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 I think we, we lose the importance of things like recharging, rejuvenating, you know, especially when there's so much sanctions on what you're able to do and what you're not able to do. But we need to be able to find those things that are, I mean, like you said before, we've now all become doubles maker, roti maker, pilori maker, things that we never even thought that we would try before the pandemic, that we're trying all of these new things. And I'm, I'm sure the athletes are, are now doing a lot more research and finding ways that, of things that they didn't think before. Is there, is there an concept online that exists to train online cricket. You know, we see some questions coming through in the Q&A and we assure you that whatever is not answered here, we will try to reach out to the, to the panelists separately and ask them offline and answer them so that we can, we can get, make sure that everybody that has a question is answered, whether it's here or offline. Yeah, being able to be fearless, you know, you're in this situation, you don't know what the future holds, you just really need to take the goal by itself and just go for it. Whatever you can research, whatever comes to mind, what people may have been recommending, as uh, uh, Dr. Mahoney was talking about, you know, reach out to your friends, as we were talking about um, to Miss King, you know, make sure that you connect with the young ones. I think it's being fearless and saying to yourself, I am not going to let this pandemic crush me. We need to make a change, we need to transform ourselves, and the way we do things. And let's look at another question that, um, that Nadine, I think, has mentioned, uh, has asked. Any recommendations for dealing with quarantine fatigue, particularly regarding low energy and motivation? 
And I think we touched on it in a few ways, in a few different ways, you know, looking at how you energize yourself, um, focusing on eating well and making sure that you have, uh, you maintain good wellness. Um, but any of the panelists, do you want to take that question? Actually, um, I can I actually, I was thinking, I could probably contribute in a, in a small way. I think that, you know, going back to when I mentioned what I, what made me launch my business at this point in time, um, being the fact that people are not dealing well with their, with the isolation that they're being faced with, right? Um, a, a big part of that, why people are becoming so depressed and anxiety is rising is because of that fatigue of being alone, being at home, you know, COVID-19, you can't go out, you just, and being stuck indoors all the time, it can really bring about a, a sense of um, fatigue and, you know, lack of motivation to just get up and do anything. And I think that's where, um, I think it was Dr. Mohammed said, um, reaching out to friends, right, communicating, reaching out to someone who because everyone is dealing with the same thing right across the globe right um so you know just reaching out to someone and talking to them um maybe having like she said um you know a uh, a party right you have to be innovative and creative and find ways to um deal with the situation because we all understand now that it's not something that's going away and we have to find ways to cope we have to work together to do that so um, Stacey said, mentioned that she is very self-motivated. Not everyone, as she, as she correctly said, not everyone is self-motivated. Some of us depend on, you know, being in a team or leaning on another person to do so. So don't be afraid to reach out. Um, as we mentioned that, I would also like to mention something that I have started a few months ago. It's called Coffee Chat. So this is a forum where I provide emotional support for individuals who may need it, who have been struggling with COVID-19 and, um, you know, the pandemic fatigue, as, as Dr. Mohammed just said here. Um, you know, it's something that we need to support one another. And we need to find new and creative ways to motivate ourselves, whether it's going on YouTube and finding a workout program that you can do from at home. Um, it may not be as exciting as the gym. This is something that I'm struggling with myself. Um, you know, but finding a new way to go about it is very, very important and it can really help a lot. So thank you for that answer, Priyanka. And I think um, we thank the first panelists for their openness, for their contributions, um, for their answering of the questions. I think the same sentiments is coming across in, like Giselle said, in, in things that we need to do, that take care of ourselves, wellness, you know, leverage our power, leverage what, like, like Dr. Mohammed said, leverage what you think your superpower is to help us get through this time and, and build on it. And like um, Ms. Pascal said, you know, take time to focus in and focus on your goals. You know, what, what the pandemic has allowed us to do is slow down, slow down and focus. Focus on what it is you really want to do going forward. And you know, it may be opening your own business. It may be doing different things, training in a different way, but really hone in on your skills and focus on what the future holds. Um, so at this time, I think we're going to wrap up panel one, continue to ask your questions, like I said, even if it refers to panel one and specific questions to the first set of panelists, we will continue to answer them offline. Um, and, but at this time, I will turn over to Giselle and she will do the introductions for the second set of panelists. So our second set of panelists are very, very right and they have a lot to tell us today so stay tuned please make sure that you're at the edge of your computer we're looking at boosting productivity taking risks and finding the financial support to thrive in the new challenging normal that's going to be focused on the discussion um, can mentoring assist during this time so they'll be looking at some of those things um and let me introduce you to the panel we start with um Jimena Salti, Saldana. she's a trained uh, media personnel, both in written, press, and radio and television, and her experiences include media management and operation. Considered one of the most influential women in the world's, in the world's Olympic movement, she's the first woman to be named vice president and the Mexican, of the Mexican Olympic Committee, member of the Executive Council for Americas of the Association of National Olympic Committees, 
and is a member of the Public Affairs and Social Development through Sports Commission of the International Olympic Committee, Vice President of the uh, Central American and Caribbean Sports Organization as well. And she also served as Secretary General of the Pan American Sports Organization. Throughout her professional career, she has promoted gender equality in various national and international forums in which she participates, as well as the promotion and dissemination of sport, particularly among young people. So that is uh, Jimena Saldana. And our second panelist is Nicole Kubritz. She has worked almost 30 years of experience in government and is a servant of the public, basically. She is a senior legal policy advisor at the Department of Foreign Affairs of the government of Aruba. Nicole competed as an athlete in synchronized swimming at the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Games and presently holds several leading positions in the Olympic movement, both in Aruba and in the international level. She's a member of the International Olympic Committee since 2006 and elected in 2017 as a member of the organization's executive board. She's a chair of the IOC Coordination Commission for the Los Angeles 2028 Olympic Games. And she's a vice chair of the IOC Coordination Commission for the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. A very exciting time for her. At the continental level, uh, Nicole was the first woman at the executive committee of the Pan American Sports Organization and in Pan Sports. She also oversees the protocol portfolio as being the organization's chancellor. So we have very exciting things coming there from Nicole very soon. And our final panelist is sent to the Honorable Laurel Lizama Leasing. She's a consultant on population and development with specific focus on women. So again, another powerful panelist to have with us. She also operates within, the, within Trinicene.com, a multimedia company. She's currently serving a second term as a government senator in the 12th Republican uh, Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, having um, previously served during the 9th Parliament from 2007 to 2010. She's passionate about the advocacy, philanthropy in Trinidad and Tobago, particularly as it pertains to children's and women's affairs. And she's a council member of the Girl Guides Association of Trinidad and Tobago and the Public Relations Officer for the People's National Movement. She has in the past held directorships in uh, several youth as well as community and women's based organizations. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen, a very powerful panel. And uh, we start with Jimena Saldana. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. To all of you. I'm very happy to be with you this morning. It's a real, real privilege to be able to share with these participants in this forum. I believe a lot in the power of women, but also the power of sports, and especially in these times. Um, I'll tell you just briefly about me. I'm already 53 years old. I'm a mother of two, and I have been involved for more than 30 years in the sports leadership. Although I love sports, I was never such a sharp athlete. So <laughs> I moved to the part of uh, sports leadership, which I consider a big tool to be able to help and really change lives of the athletes. I, I believe that uh, the sports leadership really has only one meaning, which is to take the good care of our athletes for their well-being so that they can really do their utmost out there in the playing field. I have certain life premises this, which I believe that apply not only to my personal life, but also to life in sports, which is mainly never to take things personally. I think that we women sometimes do, you know, everything that happens, we, we, we try to dive in and understand what's really happening and take things much on a personal basis. And I believe that in sports, you have to take away all of those feelings and be able to push away politics from your real goals. I believe that you really always in your life have to fight for those things that you really believe in. And always I have felt that uh, one of the premises that I would like to share is that you always have to believe in your inner voice, you know, your instincts. I believe we women share all this. Uh, uh, sometimes when you feel something inside of you and you say, this is the way I have to do it. And even though it doesn't look really uh, as a good way, you have to believe in yourself. I, I never forget that the center of my life is, is here at home with my kids and my husband. I, 
I think I found a good partner of my life to be able to be sharing and supporting all of my goals. And I believe that every time I hear, uh, like I did today with these panelists, uh, when you really find your strength in your family, your children, the people around you, I think that is sometimes where you, where you rest, as, as, as you said before, and you get your force to go back again and do what you need to do to feel better and to change lives. I believe that, that this is a real tool. Sports has always been a generator of, of beneficial life, of, of well-being, and I, I appreciate to hear these inspiring stories. I have to tell you that one of my favorite leaders in the Olympic movements um, when it comes to women is Nicole, who I'm sure you will enjoy very much hearing about, about her life and about her stories and about things we share and love about Olympism. But always I have to tell you, I feel a little jealous about, about you having Brian Lewis around. I believe he is a really good promoter of women's sport. I, every time I listen to his words, every time I read what he writes, uh, I find this strength, you know, I find this way to, to keep on doing things and to keep on fighting for the things I believe in. Uh, I, when I heard about this forum for the first time and I heard the name was Embracing Change, I could never feel related to a phrase that, like that. I always, uh, now that, we, that unfortunately Ruth Bader uh, passed away soon, um, she said something about change and she said real change and enduring change happens one step at a time. So I believe we have to do that. We, this is a real hard time for us in the Olympic sports as well as in the whole planet. And when you find that you're going through some things that we share with all of you, uh, we really have to embrace change. We really have to take time, as, as the doctor Mohammed said, to breathe, to breathe in things and say, we are happy for what, grateful for what we have, but we have to keep on striving. And not to get away from what uh, our, our theme is, our subject this morning, I believe this pandemic has brought along some uh, terrible things to all of us, but as well, we need to find things that uh, can be something of, of benefit to all of us. And one of those things actually, I believe is the power of sports and the power of the Olympic Games of Tokyo next year. Um, you're asking about the productivity and how we are going to find financial support. And I believe that this pandemic will bring back to the Games in Tokyo next year something very special, which is going back to the basic principles and ideals of the Olympic movement. I believe that we got a lot of change in time and I think that this is a good time for sports and this is a good time to embrace the principles and ideas of the Olympic movement. Great. Um, Thank you for that powerful introduction. I think it's important for us to remember one little thing that you said there initially, find strength in our family to be able to motivate us and keep us strong and focused. And, and that's important. And many times we get involved in so many different things and we forget about our family how important they are to be able to push us and motivate us. Uh, those of us who don't have that opportunity to have family to motivate us, that is another issue. And that's where we come together as peers, as women in, in a strong solidarity to be able to help and support each other. So we have to also remember that. And I like your quote about from, um, from Ruth uh, Ginsburg saying that real change happens one step at a time. Sometimes we want things to be rushed. We want things to happen now. And many times that's not possible. And so to remember those words, we need, we need to, to focus on those words, I should, I should say. You know, it really, really takes time, one step at a time. Definitely. Change, right? So let's, let's now welcome Nicole Kuritz to give us her story and to give us some more insight. Hi, thank you very much, Nadine and Giselle. I hope that you can all hear me. Um, <laughs> Okay, very good. At the uh, beginning of this, uh, this seminar on advancing women in leadership positions, I would like to share a specific number with you. The uh, World Economic Forum, in its uh, annual uh, report on gender equality, uh, states a very important message, and it says that it, it is going to take us 217 years for us to finally reach parity at the world level. 
And when I heard that and when I read that, I was really a little bit worried and, and very frustrated because I said, you know, I have a lot of time, I have a lot of patience, and I know that it's going to take us one step at a time, but 217 years, that's really too long. I want to say hello to everybody and introduce myself. It was already mentioned, my, uh, my, uh, some of my uh, things that I've done in my life that I've been privileged to do. And I'm very, very happy to be with you this morning here at this uh, seminar organized by the TTOC. And it's a very dynamic leader, Brian Lewis, who is really a champion for women. He's a he for she, as we want, would like to call him. And he's a clear example of how an organization is really defined by the tone at the top. And in that sense, I'm very happy that we have a president who believes in the power of women and the power of women in sports. You are very privileged also to have a very dynamic minister of sports who we have met last year at a seminar that was organized by Pan Am Sports and by the USOC in, in Miami, and who is a clear example of believing in the power of women in sports and believing in the power of sports, just like Jimena just said. I thank and I really salute all the speakers and the panelists who are extraordinary women whose uh, intervention I've really enjoyed. And I, of course, support the message that they have shared with us this morning. I would like to say that um, in a very brief uh, intervention that I am allowed to do because of time constraints, it will not take us uh, too much uh, to, to come to the point that at the Olympic movement, the IOC is really pushing the NOCs and uh, the international federations, the national federations, to really take up this challenge and have more women in leadership positions. Women belong. That's the very important message that the Professor Mohammed shared with us this morning. Women really belong at all levels where decisions are made. We are very proud and very happy that we have reached an almost 50-50% participation at the athlete level, but it's still where we have to move our, our focus is to get more women in leadership positions. We need more women at the decision-making tables. Uh, per personally, I have had the privilege to very often be the first woman in any position, and that makes you feel good, it makes you feel proud, but as Kamala Harris shared with us uh, recently, it is not the fact that you are the first woman, you have to make sure that you are not the last woman in a position so that when you reach the top and reach a certain position, that you make sure to send that elevator down because we have to make uh, create opportunities for more women to reach that position. We have to create more opportunities for women. We have to make sure that women get to where we, we need them, which is at the decision-making levels. But we also have to make sure that we, through these advocacy seminars like we're doing this morning, we reach this, uh, share this message with more women. But in addition to that, we have to make sure that women really make a transition from that position where they doubt and where they feel like, well, you know, I, I could do this. I, I think I can. I think I want to make that shift to, yes, I am ready for this. I am ready to take up a position. I'm ready to take up a position of leadership of decision making and that takes training it takes coaching it takes mentoring so especially in in this pandemic period in this very challenging period i urge you and i encourage all women to make use of the opportunity to follow uh, these uh, online seminars to follow do a lot of uh, personal training do a lot of personal uh, looking inward thinking and i share all what has been said uh, by my previous uh, speakers and previous colleagues, I believe in, in that, that's what we have to do. At the Olympic movement, we have a, a, a cycle, an Olympic cycle, that makes that around the Olympic Games, which were postponed and are, are going to take place next year in Tokyo, around the Olympic Games, the Olympic movement and its NOCs, its national federations, its international federations hold their elections. I encourage you, I call on all of you to take up this challenge, believe in yourselves and put your name forward for a position when the elections come around. 
I, I believe absolutely in the power of women also in decision-making positions. And I hope that by next year, by the end of the cycle, of the electoral cycle, we can have more women in, in decision-making positions. That is what I believe my, my, my responsibility is, to encourage more women to take up these leadership positions. And uh, whenever I can help in any way, I hope that, uh, that, uh, that you will reach out to me and I will reach out to you so that we can together reach this goal. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. That's very, very encouraging for us women um, generally, uh, not just here in Trinidad and Tobago, but across the world and all of those people living, uh, actually viewing us now from different countries. Very motivating, very inspiring. I, I, I almost feel like signing my nomination form now. Like, where do I sign? Who I hope you do. I hope you do. <laughs> And I hope that we won't have to wait 217 years to reach that. I was, I was just going to say that. I was going to say we want to do this and we want to walk a lot of time. And we really can't wait for that. And we are so happy and we agree with you, Nicole, to have Brian. He or she. Very, very important to us here in Trinidad and Tobago. So we're very honored to have that. So let's go on to our, our next panelist, uh, Ms. Laurel Lizama Leasing. Welcome, Laurel. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to our Honorable Minister, to our TTOC President, to our panelists, our moderators, and to all of you viewing here. Good morning, and thank you very much for having me here as a participant uh, on this panel and on this very, very important uh, and groundbreaking webinar, I would say. Um, you know, I think the topic this morning is fantastic. The ethos, rather, of the TTOC, which speaks to the future, is female. There is so much promise and so much life within that statement. And what is more significant for me is the fact that the president of the TTUC has making it, made it his personal mission to breathe life into that ethos of the future is female. We listened to the minister, Honorable Shamfa Kuju, and she said that women in leadership should be a distinctive feature of the new normal. And I think that is a pillar upon which we must build. And that is something that really ought to come out of these discussions. And as, my, uh, as the previous speaker said, Nicole, as she talked about, she was hoping more women would put themselves forward and make themselves available to accept positions on the International Olympic Committee and any other committee, whether it's in the sporting fraternity, uh, the political arena, or any form of, of service and leadership that is needed. We also had... Um, our TTOC president, mm -hmm. Brian Lewis, speak to the gender regressive practices mm -hmm. and the systemic and structural inequalities with which we are plagued and what we face at these current times. What we have to realize is that this pandemic is in fact giving us the opportunity to challenge that, to shake it, to break it as women and to take full mm -hmm. advantage and show that we can do it just as well we can most likely do it even better. What we have learned from this pandemic is that the majority of people who have been affected job-wise and within the home would be the women. Women have been the ones who have been more charged with taking care of children who have to stay home and learn. Some women have had to take a very, very difficult decision to leave the workplace in order to maintain familiar relationships to take care of their children. The current circumstances do not allow for many people to have other people come in to support them, uh, grandparents who belong to the vulnerable populations, or even housekeepers or helpers or aunties or grannies because that is widespread exposure. And what we have found is that women have found themselves in a very challenging position of having to take care of their children, take care of their homes, try to work from home, um, try to maintain their leadership professional positions, mm -hmm. try to survive. And so when we speak to what the topic of this panel specifically is, which is boosting productivity, taking risks, finding financial support, and even the, sub, the subtopic of, uh, mm -hmm. of can mentoring assist during this time, we realize there's a, there's a lot positive opportunity coming out mm -hmm. of this pandemic. There are many negatives coming out of it, but this 
is a platform for opportunity. And we have to recognize that change is inevitable. It is not always easy to embrace. It is not always easy to achieve, but it's something that we have to accept gradually, eventually, purposefully, and it is something that we have to continue to work towards and not give up. So this pandemic really gives us the, the, the advent of the, this very, very uh, uncharted territory mm. really is an opportunity for women and an opportunity for all of us to ensure that the women claim their space in the future because the future is female. Women do belong. Women have to help other women. We must help other women and we must for our own mental preservation, build our own support networks, whether it's friends, professional colleagues, uh, professional assistants, we must build those networks and we must look out for one another. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions of this panel and thank you very, very much. Uh, we have some really exciting people here, and very experienced people, so thank you for this opportunity. Yes, great. We're, we're really excited about this as well. And, um, and so far, so good. I've been really learning a lot. Uh, it's been very motivating and I'm, I'm sure to many people. In fact, there was a gentleman on the chat just now, Kevin Battle, that said during this pandemic, the sleeping dragon has been awakened and that being woman. And I thought that was so good. Uh, when we were talking about superhumans, you know, um, you know, super superpowers, maybe the dragon would be my, my, my superpower. But anyway, so that was very enlightening. Uh, thank you, Laurel. I think it's important for us to understand that the opportunity is now for us to challenge ourselves, to go beyond and, and, and see what capabilities we have for change, for diversity, for transformation. And, you know, and I important. think what has come across in, in, in all the panelists, so far, panel one, panel two, and, and, and even Dr. Mohammed, is the importance of solidarity. Solidarity with each other as, as women, as sports administrator, whatever niche you would like to place yourself into, it is, it is about helping and uplifting. And I think what was amazing that Nicole said was that when it being the first is not what is important, it's making sure that you are not the last. It's, because I personally was the first, I was I was the first ever zonal chairman in, in the basketball commission. And you know, I, I thought I was so proud, but it really struck me when she said that. It's not being proud and being the first, it's making sure that you are not the only one and sending that ladder down to make sure that you know there are 10 others after me, or every zone has a woman as a chairman, or the entire basketball federation now has a woman as the president. You know, it's important that we not only think that what we've done is important, but try to help and uplift everyone else. That's why I thought it was very interesting for a young woman to see, saying that she actually reaches out to the junior cricketers periodically. You know, and, and I think that was very, very good of you um, to, be, to be able to do that. You know, and, and I think more young people who have the power now can do that more and more. Um, yeah, and once, once we start doing that, then you know, the world's our oyster. I think we yeah. are. Can I, can I ask you that, Nadine? I, that, is, that is, for me, the most important thing. You know, it, when you're the first woman at something, it makes you feel good, but that lasts about five minutes. After Definitely. five minutes, you realize how important uh, your responsibility has, has become Definitely. in order for you to send that elevator down so that more women can come up. And I believe uh, instead of just focusing on the general advocacy uh, role that we have as, as the Olympic movement, we now have to become more specific. I would like to see specific numbers. I would like to, for us all women in, in this panel, not to be a rarity, not to be a, a something different. You know, we want to just be leaders. We just want to be leaders in the Olympic movement or in the sports movement, but not a woman. We are just the best qualified persons for a position. And in order to do that, I would like for, for us to, to be aware of the fact that we have to reach out to young women, but also to women that are already uh, active in, in some kind of capacity in, in sport and make them understand that it's, you can do it. Help them, coach them, you know, and make sure that by the time they have this opportunity that they are in fact 
they dare do this and, and not be afraid. So uh, I, I believe that that is our, our role and, and uh, succession planning is something that I really believe in. I think that as a, as a, as a leader, you're only as successful as you are in, in preparing your next generation of, of leaders. We're not gonna be here forever and not because we are gonna die, but because we're gonna move on to different things. And we have to create an opportunity for a new generation of leaders. And, and I think it's also so very important that we open athletes' eyes to the fact that sport does not end when you can no longer be an athlete. There are so many different opportunities, coaching, administration, you know, there's, there's mentorship, there's so much that exists other than, you know, Miss Alana was talking about, you know, she realized that, you know, maybe competing wasn't her 100% thing, but she realized that administration was. And likewise, very early on, I realized I love basketball, but maybe I wasn't Olympic material. I would never make an Olympic Games as a basketball athlete, but I realized that sports administration was my thing. And, you know, we, we need to put it out there that, especially to our female athletes, that this competing is not where it ends. There are so many more avenues for you to succeed and for you to lead and for you to mentor other than just competing. I think we have a question. Yes, we do. Um, we have questions for the panelists. And this question is from Ms. Saldana. It says, you are considered one of the most influential women in the world's Olympic movement. How have you been able to embrace the transformation taking place in the Olympic world because of this pandemic? And what can be done to sustain the movement financially in the years ahead, given the new normal? Okay, here's what I really believe about this. Um, I have to say that COVID-19 is bringing a lot of changes, unfortunately, to societies and economies. And I believe the poverty and the damage being done to all of us is mostly has a face of women and children, unfortunately. And of course, sports is also a part of the society that's being affected. And sometimes when everything started, when the pandemic came along, if you really sat and thought that the athletes were, had already been preparing for most of their lives for the Olympic Games in Tokyo, and suddenly, just suddenly, they find out there were no games this year. So I, when I thought about this and I said, you know, what's going through their minds when you, when you dedicate your life, you know, all of us involved in the Olympic movement, you understand that athletes have been working since children for a day like this, for an opportunity like this. And suddenly because of something you have never heard of before, everything stopped. And that's what I thought, you know, sports leaders have now the real opportunity to, to strive and do something real for the well-being and emotional support of their athletes. And I believe the International Olympic Committee and most of the continental organizations have seen this factor and have uh, activated themselves very fast. I, that's why I believe that even Tokyo is bringing uh, new opportunities to all of us. Uh, I have recently joined the now central Central Sports, uh, the Caribbean uh, Association, as vice president, and I'm the leader of the marketing commission. And I thought this was a great opportunity for our region. And here is the reason. Um, next year, we will have the Tokyo Olympic Games. I'm very certain of that. I'm very certain that it will not be the games that we have visualized a year ago, but the games will go on and the games will be there. So just imagine the whole world suffered of this pandemic we have suffered in our homes in our society in our countries and the whole planet and suddenly we'll be showcasing the best of of the of the humanity of mankind we will have an olympic festival we we have athletes there the young people that will inspire our lives are going to be meeting there in a sports challenge and in the field and we will we'll be backing them up, you know, we, 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 we don't know if there will be a whole of the spectators there, but we will surely be on our homes, on our TVs, you know, cheering them up. And I believe this is, I, I can't imagine some country or some leader saying we don't want our best athletes to be there. We all want to be there. And now it'll be, that's why I was saying it's coming back to the Olympic principles. It's going to be a real festival of sports and youth. 
So I can't imagine, uh, you know, companies or governments not being interested in investing in their in the performance of their athletes, in the well-being of the athletes there. And I believe this is a great opportunity for marketing for the sports organizations. You know, we want to have our athletes there doing their best. So companies are going to be seeing this. You know, there's sports has always been a way to understand even your nationality i don't know if all of you have ever thought when you first felt as a citizen of your own country and i can i can remember that i i felt it on a soccer match and you know you you understand oh i'm from that team you know i'm from mexico so i i believe that's where you really understand your own nationality and you say well i'm from this team and this is going to happen real big next year in Tokyo. We will all be behind our athletes. So I can't imagine we, we, as a sports leader, we cannot miss this opportunity to put in all the political agendas of our countries, sports as one of the main things that you have to focus on. And I cannot believe we all do not want to take part in these games. I think the games will be uh, the great moment of, of the world again to breathe and say, we're here, we're celebrating, we're all together, we made it and we are stronger. So I really believe that this is a great opportunity for sports organizations to go out there and get the funds and the resources we need to make our organizations stronger and to make our athletes perform better. Yes, I agree. That, 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 that makes absolute sense. And I think, you know, Emilia, you are actually talking about all the things that we're talking about today. You're talking about fearlessness, being you know driven, knowing that that we have to take risks. You know, all of that is in preparation to Tokyo. And if, if if we think of the fearlessness, if we think of the the productivity and and the innovation and all of that, that that event will definitely be a good one and will come off well. And whether there are audiences in there or not, you know, there will be audiences worldwide, whether it's on I think television, entirely, you know. So I mean, I, mean, I, I know that I've never personally been to an Olympic Games, but there's no feeling like seeing my flag raised and hearing my national anthem. I stand at attention home in my house when Kishon Walker won gold, and I stood up like I was in the stands. I mean, there's no feeling like that in the world. Um, so I think what the pandemic has also challenged us to do is think outside the box. You know, this box, is what we do for fundraising. This box is what we do for marketing. But what can we do outside the box, this box? What exists out there? You know, usually in terms of supporting our athletes or supporting our IOCs, we have a template and we have, okay, we do this, we do this, we do this, we do this. But now here we come, we can't do this and we can't do this and we can't do this. So let's regroup and think about what we can do. So it's challenged all of us to think outside of what you know we, we keep throwing away throwing around the word the new normal but it the new normal is not just wearing a face mask or washing your hands or social distancing the new normal is your way of thinking that is the new normal it's think outside of what you normally would think of and talking about that I actually have a question coming from um, somebody from our audience and I'll address it to you, Nicole, actually. It says, what strategies do you suggest to deal with imposter syndrome, feeling that you may not deserve to be sitting at the table full of men? What's your take on that, Nicole? I, have, I, I don't recognize that feeling. I've never felt you know, that I didn't belong to sit at the table. I thought you know, we always belong. And, and in fact, maybe that is something that we have to get used to we are human beings we are women we are very capable intelligent people and we deserve to sit at that table so it's not so i've never felt that i didn't belong at that table so uh yes of course uh, uh we need more women at the table but not because we don't belong at the table. we, we do belong we 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 really uh are entitled to that i wanted to come back to to one thing because we're talking about uh you know adapting to this new normal and uh, just yesterday I took part in the, the meeting of the coordination commission for the Olympic Games of Tokyo and if you're talking about adaptability then this is a, a school book example of adaptability and, and creativity and, and 
just, you know, changing and challenging everything. The Olympic Games from Tokyo, as the president, President Bach likes to call it, these are going to be games that are fit for the post-COVID world. These are not gonna be the regular Olympic Games. We have gone through many, many exercises of making, uh, taking measures to, to make them simpler, to make them more, uh, more economically sound because the world expects that from us not lavish big games, but games that are really fit for the post-COVID world. And that is not just for the games in Tokyo, because it always, it, it's also applicable to our own continent and our own region. Jimena is part of the, uh, the, well, I have to remember the new name of our organization, Jimena. It used to be CACSO, the Central American and Caribbean Sports Organization. Now it's called Central Caribe Sports, so that's a new name of this organization, and we're all adapting our own games to this new reality. Next year, we're going to have the first edition of the Junior Pan American Games. These are also going to be more uh, simple and more uh, economic uh, sound games. Th that's the message that we're all, all taking away from this. Think outside the box. Be creative be uh, there do things differently not because we have done something always in the same way that that is what we have to do forever the reality is going to be very different than what we are used to the going back to business as usual and that's that's absolutely off the table that is not going to happen anymore i don't believe in a new normal i believe in a new reality the new reality in sports and sports organization is going to be totally different than what we are used to doing up to now. And that is something that we have to challenge ourselves as sports uh, leaders to, to make sure that we move, uh, you know, be creative, be, think differently, think outside that, that, that normal box. I think, um, I think that you're my kindred spirit when you see that, that um, Mr. Lewis is standing, he's looking at me and, I, and he's shaking because I think you're I think you're my kindred spirit because I don't I don't have those feelings that I don't belong at a table. If I if I if I felt that way, I would pick up my table and go home and say, you know what, it's you that doesn't belong, not me. And and you know, I look at things generally that you know, you know, we're saying about women and women and women, and it's 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 not necessarily about being women it's about e being equal when you look at my resume my resume looks exactly like yours so i i don't belong here because i more women should be included i belong here because i'm just as qualified and i deserve the opportunity just as much as anybody else and not because there should be more inclusion for women um you know at this time i think i have a question for mrs zama lise and um do you think that women have been more affected by the pandemic by men and, and why? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, but before I go to the question, can I just can I just touch on something that you just said? Sure, of course. Uh, with the woman, where where um, when you're talking about your CV looks the same as perhaps uh, just for for reference, let's say Mr. Lewis's, um, him being the known male in this discussion at this point in time. Um, I see he does not look the same in his badges, by the way, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but. But no, but the reality is that very often women are intimidated. Women are very much intimidated and are afraid to take up the mantle of leadership. And something Nicole talked about, I think she said, where, um, who are you going to pull up the elevator? And it ties into the concept of mentorship, which is a part of the cool theme in this, in this panel discussion as well. And I think it's really very, very important for us to keep in mind a few things. Um, one, this is a new generation of leaders, and I think a number of young women coming up are, are, are pretty bold and emboldened and they feel empowered. But very often, uh, and I'm very sorry to say this, we have seen where women have not turned around to help these young women to pull them up, and that can be a challenge. And so I challenge the women here and the women of the TTOC and the women of the International Olympic Committee to ensure that they do not actually practice that sort of um, or engage in that sort of practice and and it's important for us to let the younger women know 
that even if you don't think that you belong, or even if you don't think that you're capable of doing um, what may be necessary, just jump in head first, really. And you're going to learn on the way up. And there will be people who will come and help you. There will be people. You have the Nicoles and the Jimenez who are guaranteed to turn around and help you and to extend a hand of friendship, of leadership, and of support. And really and truly, it's to encourage you, uh, as you were speaking to Nadine, um, that you didn't think you'd be an Olympic basketballer, but you found out that you're a good administrator. Bloom where you are planted. If you find that you're functioning well, you really just try your very best to do your best within um, that portfolio. Uh, we, are, we all agree that sports and music would be the two universal languages and unifiers. And this sport, the opportunity for Olympics uh, to happen in Japan next year, um, and the opportunity of using sports as a tool for development and for leadership is something that we should not really uh, take lightly and it's something that we need to maximize absolutely. And now I want to go to the question of, um, do you think women are more affected than men? If I answer you off the cuff, I will say yes. <laughs> off the cuff, I will say yes. Um, and, I revert to, and I revert to the thought that the women are the ones who are being more challenged to stay at home to take care of children. The women are the ones who are thought to be more um, dispensable than the men. Be that's just because of the way society is built in many, many circumstances, not in all, in many circumstances. But that is not to say that men are not actually being adversely affected, affected by the pandemic. You know, um, some men have also lost their jobs. There's a, a, a minimization of income, work opportunity, uh, men who have their own businesses, perhaps contractors, things like that, where industries have slowed down. But, but you will find from statistics from the UN women, from their website, statistics show that it's women. 41% of women, I believe, are the ones who um, have been adversely affected employment-wise, whereas it's 31% for men. So if you're looking from a statistical point of view, world, the world over, it shows that women have been the one who are more um, affected because of new demands within this new reality, not the new normal, as Nicole said, within our new reality, um, within this COVID world that we live in. So I do think that women are in fact um, a little more adversely affected because we keep the, we maintain these traditional rules for women. And while that's all well and good, um, Tradition is not going to take us through this pandemic. True. Very, very true. Very, very true. So I, as we're talking about that, somebody brought us, sent us a question here saying, what do you think is the role of men in ending the gender gap? And the question is being asked directly to Ms. Saldana, and I recognize the name asking the question, and that is because she is a a pioneer being one of, she's actually a, a sports reporter and being one of very few female sports journalists that we have in Trinidad and Tobago. And she's the one asking this question directly to Ms. Saldana. Thank you. I truly believe men have a big role to play in, in giving women these new opportunities. And why am I saying this sounding a little bit macho style? Because when I, came first involved in the Olympic sports and the whole movement was mostly handled by men. And we really couldn't find women around us in the meeting rooms and everywhere we were. Uh, you know, women were, were there probably playing a, a role behind scenes. And uh, I was actually working at that time with one of the sports leaders of our continent, Mario Vasquez Raña. And uh, he was never considered as a man, a were of the power. However, he, he was indeed inside of himself. He, he truly believed in women and he opened up opportunities for women around the Olympic movement. But one of the things that I consider was one of the, the, the real things, you know, back then at the beginning, about 20, 30 years ago, uh, they started speaking about women's sports and women's sports commissions and it was only talk and talk and talk and maybe a few numbers would appear there, but you didn't see something real behind this, these words. And suddenly uh, in the Association of National Olympic Committees, they said, 
Well, you know, in the meeting rooms where we meet the whole assembly, that means 205, 206 National Olympic committees, and barely you could see women around you. Uh, we started working along with Gunilla Lindbergh, who was the ANOC Secretary General, and we thought we could ask the continents to send five women along to the assemblies. You know, they didn't have to play a special role or have a special position, but being involved in the Olympic movement in their countries. And so suddenly we found these 25 women around us who were there participating, hearing for, for you know, uh, real assemblies, what was going on, what decisions were being taken. And I think this was a, a very good way to open up to new opportunities because sports leaders would then realize, you know, the women that are here with us have something to say, have something to do, have new ideas. You know, uh, this is something I thought was a very good experience back then. I'm talking about many years ago, but this is something that a man did, you know, because he had the power to, to generate this. So I believe that, that really men have this power in the Olympic sports to open up. But now, now we're there. And I truly believe in sending down the elevator. I believe that women, uh, yeah, as you have all said, we feel satisfied when you're there. And I was the first uh, secretary general women of a continental association. And this was indeed a, a big privilege. And I felt very happy to do that. But I never saw this as a role for a women. I saw this as a role that you work for and something that you devote your life to. And suddenly you understand that but yes, you, you have to open up another doors. And there you find interesting and inspiring stories, as I, as I said about Brian Lewis. And I'm not just saying this because he might be hearing us. I'm saying this because I really believe when I, when I sometimes, you know, life hasn't been good or sometimes the link with movement is, is something, you know, a, a kind of, of heavy in your shoulders. And you listen to his words and you, you think, yeah, I, I have to be here. I have to work and because I believe in this, you know, and he's very inspiring and he's been doing actions that, that are opening up doors for women. So I do believe they have a role to play, but I do believe that it's mostly now in the hands of us women to keep on working for this. Uh, it's, it's sending the elevator down, but it's, as we just heard Nicole, it's inspiring. It's, it's something that suddenly you say, well, yes, maybe I'm capable of running for this position, you know? And because you always think of, of someone better, uh, because we, we have this fear and it happens to me a lot, but then I listen to these leaders and I say, well, I have to try, you know, at least I have to try and run for it. Mm -hmm. So I do think they have a role to play. It's a very important thing, but I also believe we women have to keep on pushing for these ideas to come along and become a reality. Absolutely, you're very, very right. right. Yeah. And, and I hope Rachel King that uh, she answered your question eloquently. Um, I would like to though end this session, this panel discussion with one question to Nicole. And what are your hopes for the future of the young athletes after this pandemic is over? Or maybe just what are your hopes for the future? Oh, I have many hopes. <laughs> I am a very positive and optimistic person by nature. I'm a, a highly self-motivating person. But I believe that through sports, absolutely, we can create a better world. And I hope that the, the young people feel inspired by, by all these, these wonderful people and wonderful examples that the world of sports offers them. Uh, I would like to, before I, I go back, just one very specific item that I think that everybody needs to know. Uh, we have been working very much from home. And that is in, a, in, in many senses, something very positive. It has made us focus more on family and made us focus more on our mental health and our psychology and everything that, that goes around with that. But we have to realize, and this, this is something very sad, that the home, not for everybody, is a safe place. Uh, abuse and, and, and uh, you know, violence against, in particular, women, is very prevalent and when we talked about the the stress that, that this being at home presents for many people we have to realize that we have to be protective of everybody in their home situations women and children very often so this is something that i really want to make a point about because everybody thinks that being at home is always a very positive thing not for everybody but going back to to being hopeful for the future yes i am very hopeful for the future I am hopeful because we have 
leaders at the top, like Brian Lewis, like your Minister of Sport, like President Bach, like at the continental level, Nevin Illich, who really push and empower women to take up these uh, positions of responsibility. I'm also hopeful because I'm convinced because I'm very closely involved in, in my National Olympic Committee, but also at the International Olympic Committee, that the Games of Tokyo are going to be a beacon of hope for all the, the sports organizations, for the NOCs, and in particular, and that's what we're doing it for, for the athletes. Jimena mentioned, just imagine you being an athlete and having prepared for so many years to go to the Olympic Games in Tokyo and make your dream come true, and this suddenly, out of the blue, there comes this crisis, this pandemic, this, 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 this something that you have never even thought of and, and really mixes up all your dreams and your plans. We are working very hard to make the Tokyo Games a reality. I'm convinced that they will become a reality and that they, be, they will be the light at the end of the tunnel. So I thank all of you for, for offering us this opportunity this morning to share our, all our thoughts and our ideas uh, with, with this uh, wonderful group of people. A few hundred people are logged in and are part of this, this event. And I thank everybody who has made it possible and has organized this wonderful uh, forum. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you also for touching on that bit of violence because that was one of the questions that we had coming up here. And just remember that any questions that you put in the Q&A that have not been answered, they will be answered eventually. Um, someone from here will get back to you. Uh, just to, to wrap up a little bit, I just want to bring out some points that were touched. Um, we looked at the positive elements coming out of the pandemic that, that we could look at. We looked at the, the fact that change is inevitable no matter what, and we just have to embrace it and really work together to, to make you know, change happen and to, to our benefit. We talked about um, the analogy, and, and I love that analogy, about sending up the elevator and supporting each other and making sure that we, we, we pull each other up, especially as women and especially in leadership in particular. And we talked about unleashing, you know, our superpower, you know, being able to, to get that grit and to be able to be fortuitous and resilient and to be able to be innovative as well, all at Definitely. the same time, you know? So I think we, we, we touched on so many wonderful things. Uh, I think the panels were, were well, well put together. I think the topics that we covered, covered many, many things. We looked at leveraging power. We looked at being fearless and we looked at innovation during this pandemic, we talked about productivity, taking risks, all of those sorts of things. And I think it was a huge amount of uh, topics that we looked at that I think will benefit everybody who is out there. So I thank you very much. So we just, um, we just want to very briefly, if any of the panelists from panel one or panel two, um, if there was anything that you feel that we missed in the questions or if there was anything that you particularly wanted to address very quickly because we just have a couple of minutes if there's anything that anybody any of the panelists across the board just wanted to add very briefly we just give you that opportunity now for just a couple of minutes no we're all good no if i was just waiting to see if somebody wanted to go first i i just hope that we can really believe in in the power of women the power of sports and my mantra has always been she believed she could so she did oh, very lovely mantra I, it's it's something to take on boy i think we're gonna pin it up around here my personal mantra has always been um People only treat you how you allow them to treat you has always been my personal mantra in life and, and I apply it across the board, whether it's your children, your husband, your boss, anybody. People only treat you how you allow them to treat you. And if we allow, we, we need to allow, have people treat us how we feel we need to be treated, whatever, whatever the spectrum is. Anybody else? One thing I'd like to add. You know, I think a lot of us get caught up in planning. You know, we focus a lot on planning, planning, planning. I think we need to step back on the planning a bit and start to execute, execute, and execute. And you know what? You're going to get perfection along the way, but it never happens first. And it's okay. If we all start to do more as women, we'll be recognized that we will start to blaze, blaze even more powerful and um, remarkable trail, trail 
than we currently are. Don't let fear stop you. Just go for it. Fear and, and of course, definitely take risks because you will not achieve anything if you don't take any risks. You know, having said that, coming from a, coming from a working background in advertising, we have a saying, it's, it's better to be 80% correct and moving than 100% correct and standing still. So, you know, that's, that's the thing we operate on. And then, like you were saying, planning, planning, planning. And then we, we get to the planning stage and then we never get to the executing stage. Well, so it's, okay. it's better. So, you know, keep moving. Yeah. So just anybody else real quickly? Um, I'd just like to say, because it was said earlier on, and I think that it's, it's a mantra to just move forward with, that we as women, we belong. And we should just continue the challenge she set us through. I think that's an opportune moment for us to stop now and just introduce. A, a quick thing, uh, uh, when you mentioned that there was this journalist uh, talking about it, I just want to say something that I heard Nicole say a few days ago, which I thought it was really important, that we understand that the sports journalists really have to encourage and motivate uh, women athletes. So it's good to, to know that you are, you're connected to, to the webinar and I, to this forum, and to understand that we also need to promote that, to have more women uh, in sports journalism and more women supporting female athletes. Yes, that's true. And I know you're a journalist as well, so you will identify with that fully. So thanks for that. So without further ado, I think we now would like to call on Diane Henderson, the Chair of Advancing Women in Leadership, to give the go to that. I'm listening so much that I um I didn't realize that I was still muted. But wow, what exciting and informative informative discussions and conversation. I was blown away here. So I know that the chat is blown away. So um really, really thank the panelists for that. So I just wanted to touch on a few things that I thought I was writing and underlining and highlighting that I thought, you know, really came out, you know. Um, I know Giselle, you did all the, 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 the ground up, but um, prior to, I can't forget prioritize your well-being and wellness, you know, that's so important. And then a mindset for being uncomfortable, we sometimes in our comfort zones, um, sharpening our mind. One that resonated with me is get yourself an accountability partner because we can't do it alone. And that identifies with solidarity and um, the mentoring, you know, and, and the lift and everything else that was said there. Um, one of the things is continue to do your personal training, you know, um, the encourage women not to take up the leadership positions. Um, and also like through this whole thing about um, executing is develop that um, team to springboard your idea, you know, just the same thing and all of it sort of aligns going forward. Um, and then Nicole, just as she spoke about Tokyo, um, she mentioned acceptance, that adaptability. And I just thought, you know, in this new reality, and that's a term now, we're not going to say new normal anymore. We're going to say the new reality. Um, you know, hashtag it. <laughs> it happened here, the Advancing Leadership Forum, Advancing, advancing Women's Leadership Forum. But acceptance, and how much things are going to change going forward. You know, I wrote that down because we ourselves have to accept the change that is happening in order for us to change. We have to accept it. You know, just a quick thing. I was, before we came on this morning, I was watching the Power Boot um, race, our great race. And I was so dissatisfied with the negative comments that some of these people were making at the commentators who were doing their best to keep them entertained while there were difficulties with the, the video coverage of the boats, everybody wanted to see the boat. But it's a new dynamic and everybody has to be able to accept the change. And as, as, as we said, execute, it may not be perfect the first time, but they'll get it right. You know what I mean? So we need to, to do the same. So really and truly, I just want to thank everyone now, starting with the Minister um, of Sport and Community Development, Shamputa Jo, for giving us her time. President Brian Lewis um, of the Olympic Committee and Commonwealth Games Association. Um, I'll start with Nicole, our panel, panelists, Nicole, Laurel, and Jimena, 
as well as Melissa, Stacy, and um, Priyanka Ugosh. Thank you so much, as well as Dr. Safiya Mohammed. Don't can't forget you at all for that dynamic presentation. All of you contributed so much. Um, and our moderators, you know, um, we couldn't do it without you. You also gave points that impacted all the, the, the discussions that were held, right? So thank you, Lovey and Lauren in the background for making sure the technology worked today. It worked fantastic. <laughs> And, um, and, all, and Annette not for being there and always supporting in the background, our Secretary General, and all the people I'm seeing, I'm seeing um, on the chat. I was so excited. I'm still um, going to be writing notes when I'm finished. So everybody, I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. Um, thank you for tuning in and see you at the next one. Great. Thank you so much, Diane. And thank you, everybody. Once again, thanks to all the panelists. Thank you for all 300, I'm sure it's almost 400 now, <laughs> um, people who actually joined us on today's program. I think it was an excellent program. I think it gives us lots of food for thought. We talk about change and transformation at this particular, particular time, but I think we need to think of transformation and change going forward in our lives. Definitely, and I think, you know, operating outside of what is our normal you know this is this is my first time doing this and when i was asked to do it i was very nervous i said yeah.